Good day to you. We're here in Cambridge in the UK, and behind me is the River Cam, which runs right through the middle of the city of Cambridge and right through the uh, campus of Cambridge University. Being a water town, water sports are quite popular with the students here, and there are two basic kinds of water sports that uh, students participate in. One is called punting. It's probably the one you're more familiar with. It uses a flat bottom boat that uh, someone steers with a pole stuck down to the bottom of the river. Uh, as you can see, this is quite a popular sport. Uh, sometimes it can be a bit, uh, as they say here, uh, shambolic. But then the other is much more uh, competitive. It uses a, a type of boat called a racing hull. Very long, narrow, sleek, and with a crew from anywhere from one to eight people. Now, we're going to look at uh, racing hulls today because they actually provide an interesting lesson in the conservation of momentum. And so, without further ado, let's have a look at it. Let's look first at some of the mechanics. The rowing cycle starts when the oar is dipped here. The rower pulls back on the oars, thrusting the hull forward in a short power stroke. The hull then coasts during the longer return stroke, which ends when the oar is dipped again here. What makes things interesting is the possibility of relative motion between the rower and hull. The rower seat is mounted on a track, outlined here in green, which allows her body, outlined here in blue, to move with respect to the hull. If we look at this from the side, we see there are two elements to the rower's relative motion. There is the motion of the whole body, indicated by the green circle at the rower's hip, as well as the motion of the torso and head, indicated by the red circle, which swivels at the hip. What determines the hull's speed, of course, is the balance between two opposing forces, thrust from the oars, which comes ultimately from the rower's muscles, and drag from the movement of the hull through the water, which depends upon the hull's speed. Without thrust, a hull already in motion will be slowed by drag, and its speed will decline exponentially until the hull is dead in the water. Thrust obviously comes from the rower, but this thrust is only intermittent. During the return stroke, drag will slow the hull until the next power stroke. In a competitive race, this loss of speed during the return stroke can spell the difference between winning and losing. The hull's streamlined design helps by keeping the drag low, which reduces the loss of speed during the return stroke. Remember, though, that the rower can move in relation to the hull. This enables rowers to use a clever trick of momentum to keep the hull's speed up during the return stroke. Let's see how. First, we remind ourselves that a body's momentum is the product of its mass and velocity. Let's pretend there's no drag to complicate things. If there are two bodies coupled together, in this case the rower and the hull, the momentum of the pair is a sum of the momentums of each. If the two bodies are rigidly coupled together, the velocity of one, say the rower, is equal to the velocity of the other, say the boat, and in turn is equal to the velocity of the boat and rower together. If the two bodies can move with respect to one another, as when the rower slides along the track, the motion is more complicated. A rower moving toward the bow is moving faster than the hull and the rower together. Here the total momentum is conserved by the boat slowing down. This is what happens during the power stroke. If the rower is moving toward the stern, however, the rower is moving slower than the boat and rower together. Here the total momentum is conserved by the boat accelerating. This is what happens during the return stroke. Now let's look at what actually happens. The complete rowing cycle for a one-person hull takes from three to four seconds. We can use image analysis to take several important measures of performance during the cycle, including the hull's forward velocity, the angle of the rower's knee, and the angle of the upper body with respect to the hull. Let's look first at the power stroke. Power is delivered to the hull in two phases, first from the thigh muscles as the knee straightens, which also drives the body toward the bow, followed by the bowward motion of the torso and head. Both movements increase the body's forward momentum, which is why the hull's forward velocity initially drops before it increases as the oars power the hull forward. With the return stroke, we see the body now moving sternward, again in two phases, first with the straightening of the torso, followed by flexing the knee to position the body for the next power stroke. Both reduce the body's forward momentum. Note how forward velocity is maintained during this phase, which otherwise would decrease as drag bleeds off the hull's kinetic energy. Drag is still working, of course, but what is happening here is that momentum that would be lost to drag is being offset by recovery of the body's enhanced forward momentum attained during the power stroke. This maintains or even increases the hull's forward speed during the return stroke. What about larger hulls? The top-of-the-line racing hull is the eight-person shell, 
How does that work? Mostly, it's a matter of scaling up power, momentum, and drag, but these scale in some interesting ways. Power during the power stroke is simply a function of the number of rowers. An eight-person shell can therefore deliver eight times the power to drive the hull forward during the power stroke. Momentum scales the same way. Compared to a single rower, the movements of eight rowers impart eight times the momentum to the hull during the return stroke. However, eight times the power does not mean that the eight-person hull goes eight times faster. The hull's speed depends upon some ratio of power and drag. If drag also scaled directly to the number of rowers, the power-to-drag ratio would not increase and speed of the large hull would be the same as for a one-person hull. But drag does not scale that way. The physics are complicated, but in general, drag scales to two factors, to the two-thirds power of the number of rowers, or the mass of the rowers, times the square of the hull's velocity. Eight raised to the two-thirds power is four. By itself, resistance for an eight-person hull is only four times that of a single-person hull, and this makes the power-to-drag ratio two. Accounting for the effect of higher speed brings this number up to about seven, still less than eight. Thus larger hulls are faster than smaller hulls. Not only is the power-to-drag ratio larger during the power stroke, but rowers in large hulls can more effectively impart forward momentum to the hull during the return stroke. Let's compare the motions in the eight-person hull compared to what we saw in the one-person hull. We see in the eight-person hull a steadier and slower backward motion of the rowers during the return stroke. The result is more sustained forward motion of the hull. This only works, though, if the movements of the team are strongly synchronized. This is the job of the coxswain who sits in the boat's stern. Even though she's effectively parasite weight in that she contributes no power, ensuring the rower's motion stays coordinated pays for itself by ensuring the best momentum recovery during the return stroke. And so we see the principle of conservation of momentum at work. The momentum being conserved, of course, is that of the hull and of the members of the crew. As the members of the crew move forward during their rowing cycle, the speed of the hull slows down momentarily but the end result is that the combined momentum of both the rowers and the hull is constant. Well, that's all for today. From Cambridge in the United Kingdom, I wish you good day.